I'm Jim Stigler, Extension Soil Management Specialist at Oklahoma State University. This conservation tillage video highlights five farmers and their no-till farming practices. They talk about how and why they now no farm without tillage grain sorghum. and offer tips to other producers thinking about switching to no-till. I hope that you find this video interesting, informative, and worth the time that you spend viewing it. A few things need to be pointed out. First, this is not an all-inclusive how-to video. For as you will see, each farmer has his own way of producing a no-till crop. Much like a conventional till farmer has his own ways. Secondly, we emphasize no-till because so many of our Oklahoma farmers say that no-till just really won't work here. I hope that this video can help dispel some of that myth. And finally, we want to acknowledge the many Oklahoma farmers who are good soil stewards and practice residue management and minimum till farming. Conservation tillage is a valuable tool we can use here in Oklahoma to help reduce wind and water erosion on cropland. The five outstanding producers you will see in this video have adopted various conservation tillage techniques that not only help them reduce soil erosion, but also help them reduce their operating cost. We in the Natural Resources Conservation Service are proud to join the Oklahoma State University Cooperative Extension Service in providing these videos to help you learn more about conservation tillage. There is assistance available from the Natural Resources Conservation Service and the Cooperative Extension Service to help you get a conservation tillage system implemented on your land. Unlike many parts of the state, eastern Oklahoma has fewer soil and water conservation issues. However, farmers can still benefit from no-till farming. Jay Franklin in Craig County grows no-till wheat, soybeans, milo, and corn. The conversion from conventional farming has kept him farming. My uh, no-till experience started in the mid-80s when uh, interest rates were high and my uh, conventional machinery was worn out and it was time to make some significant change if I was going to survive in crop production. So. Uh, I decided that uh, I was going to venture into the no-till and, uh, uh, and made a complete commitment. Sold my uh, conventional machinery and, and uh, went at it uh, completely in one year. Uh, began by renting drills to sow wheat with and uh, using a row planter with uh, no-till cultures and, and uh, no-till style uh, closing wheels on it rode all of my uh, milo and soybeans and used a no-till cultivator as kind of a crutch tool in the first couple of three years in order to uh, to uh, have a little security and, and uh, leaving all the iron completely behind. Uh, as time went on I felt like the, the um, no-till cultivator probably in my case was causing more harm than good and with compaction between the rows uh, after rains I would observed that the center of the row was was um, shiny and wet where uh, where the plants were growing it was uh, drying off uh, out of that center so got to kind of looking at compaction from the no-till cultivator and decided to make the switch then completely to a no-till drill and stayed that way until I started tinkering with corn a year ago and then went back to a planter for the corn and the milo I switched back to rowing the milo because I was having difficulty maintaining a low enough population to satisfy me in the drilled milo. If, uh, if I had some way to, to attain a low population with solid seeded milo, I'd, I'd certainly stay in that direction. But uh, since I have the corn planter, then that just seemed like the simplest way for me to accomplish a lower milo population. But I'm still certainly a fan of drill beans and uh, drill milo if you can, if you can um, control the plant population. The uh, cropping system, at least in the past, has been three crops in two years. Uh, wheat followed by double crop soybeans and then the following year milo and then the milo followed with double crop wheat. But I'm um, starting to experiment with corn, particularly short season varieties, uh, 75 and 85 day, in order to, to try to change that somewhat, uh, uh, substituting the corn for the milo in order to get the wheat crop back in earlier. One of the uh, significant changes with no-till has been the, the difference in fuel consumption, which is now uh, 
uh, harvest in all is, is less than a, a gallon an acre, uh, which is kind of exciting, especially in uh, this uh, year 2000 where uh, diesel fuel prices have taken another tremendous jump again. Herbicide cost has not increased significantly because the, uh, the chemical control in lieu of, of cultivation actually seems to reduce my, my uh, residual control requirements or post-emergent requirements later in the season. So uh, uh, herbicide bill has really not dramatically increased. Uh, certainly uh, significant labor savings, uh, the fact that it's easier to, uh, to control the planting process because if for some reason the planter stops you don't have to worry about uh, prepared ground drying out in front of you or, or rain knocking you back on what you have prepared. So turning the planting process into a one-step process certainly has been an advantage. My uh, yields over the last 14-15 years as compared to conventional before uh, have increased. I'm not sure that I can attribute all of that to no-till as much as uh, some varietal changes, especially in soybeans, through those years, but uh, certainly the yields have not suffered even from the beginning. Uh, my uh, my goal was to to maintain or slightly increase yields and try to reduce production costs as much as possible, and uh, so I've really been pleasantly surprised that that uh, yields have actually increased along the way as well. If you're considering no-till, I'd like to point out that uh, there's several, several advantages that come along the way. Uh, reduced labor, of course, reduced fuel. Um, one thing that's kind of surprised me is reduced downtime. Even though I'm running significantly older tractors than I ever have before, the environment they're running in, both being cooler with less load and, and clean, uh, has just virtually done away with tractor breakdowns during the season even though they are significantly older. I initially chose no-till over other forms of, of uh, reduced tillage just because of the simplicity, simplicity of the process. Less attachments on the planter, uh, less things to keep track of, and, and uh, more flexibility as far as preparation, not having to have beds up, uh, uh, and the ability to take on a new piece of land and then immediately convert it to no-till. I suppose my uh, only piece of advice to someone that's beginning to no-till would be to sell all of the conventional equipment you have. Uh, tillage is certainly an equalizer when it comes to uh, moisture conditions or soil tilth, but there are other ways to deal with those issues and no-till. If a person has a line of conventional equipment sitting there though, I'm afraid that you're going to be tempted to break the system every time that, uh, that an adversity happens. but. Uh, uh, I think a person can be more successful if he burns some bridges behind him and just commits wholly to the program. Tony Kodash farms no-till wheat, grain sorghum, and soybeans on his Noble County, Oklahoma farms. Labor savings, soil conservation, and moisture conservation were some of the reasons for Tony Kodash's switch to no-till farming. I first uh, started no-tilling in the fall of 1996. The main reason was soil erosion. I wanted to put a stop to that. No-till looked to me like the only way we could do it. Another big reason was help's getting hard to find out here and we wanted to cut back on labor. And. Uh, also, Freedom to Farm, the Freedom to Farm bill that the government passed in 95 uh, lets us raise other crops, which fits well into our no-till program, lets us rotate, uh, rotate our crops. Our cro cropping system uh, pretty much starts after wheat. Wheat's our, our base crop, it's our main crop in the area, but we start off with wheat. And after we harvest the wheat, we uh, no-till beans or grain sorghum back into the wheat stubble. And what we're trying to do is capture any type of soil moisture we have left or might, might receive during the summer and fall. So our double crop spreads our risk out throughout the year because sometimes we catch good rains during the summer and fall and we can catch a pretty good double crop. But instead of letting us 
letting the weed straw just sit there until next spring, we try to plant a, a double crop after the wheat to try to catch some favorable weather. And then the, then the ground then is followed till next spring where we make a decision on beans or grain sorghum at that time. And that depends on soil pH and, and uh, soil type. After we plant full season beans or grain sorghum in the spring, uh, that ground will go back to wheat that fall the same year. And then our rotation starts over again, back to wheat. After we rotate out of wheat for several years, we feel like our yield potential has went way up on our soils because we're, we're rotating our crops and we're getting away from a lot of these wheat diseases, soil-borne diseases, which have plagued us, funguses and stuff. So we feel like our uh, wheat yields potential is a lot greater on these fields because of less pressure. So we are uh, doing some intensive wheat management on our crops to try to enhance all the yield we can. Uh, we feel like the inputs we're putting on our wheat now are paying off like never before because our wheat goes ahead and makes wheat and when we, when we fertilize it, it responds and when we put uh, seed treatment on, it responds and our fungicide responds. Uh, it just, it's, our wheat is yielding so much better behind our rotation. So going for high yields in wheat now is a lot more attainable than it was when we was in continuous wheat. We also was in intensive management on continuous wheat. We just never could get the wheat plant to respond like it is now. When harvesting, Tony uses a stripper header on his combine to leave the wheat stubble standing. He finds his no-till planter works better when it doesn't have to go through a thick layer of mulch. Well, I've done some research on the stripper headers and found out if we can keep the straw intact without cutting it off and spreading it, uh, our residue stayed on ground better. The straw that is standing in the field provides a little more shade and wind protection, which is very helpful during the summer, especially here in Oklahoma. Uh, keeps our ground cooler, and keeps our evaporation rate down. And another advantage of the stripper head, other than for no-till purposes, is the speed of operation lets us harvest almost twice the speed as a conventional header. Although Tony is relatively new to no-till, he has been amazed by how clear the runoff water is coming off his field and by the substantial increases in production. Purchased my first no-till drill in the fall of 96. Our very first no-tilling operation was tilling was no tilling weed into alfalfa and in the fall. And we were amazed at the amount of grazing and and hay and and it's been, been one case where we went ahead and harvested some grain off of the alfalfa, then hayed the alfalfa with the straw and uh, we were really amazed at the at how the wheat, re wheat can grow during the dormant winter months in the alfalfa. And it hasn't hurt our alfalfa stands any. Get the weed off, and actually it's invigorated some of the alfalfa. Uh, some of the older stands, we kind of got them brought back. But we fertilize our wheat that we planted to the alfalfa. Uh, we just pretend the alfalfa's not even there, and we go ahead and feed the wheat just like it was on its own. And it really responds well. When I first seen how it responded into that hard alfalfa ground, uh, I knew that just by just because the ground is hard and firm doesn't mean that it needs ripping, because that wheat will do excellent, excellently well in alfalfa. That's never been worked. That right there showed me that if we can get our soil structure to that of alfalfa ground, uh, that's kind of our goal. And for those interested in no-till, Tony has the following advice. I think the biggest problem people see on when they first started no-till is that uh, if they go into a piece of ground that is in poor shape and hasn't been yielding well conventionally, they're probably not going to see much uh, increase or may probably see a decrease in their when they start no-tilling. Uh, First of all, if you try to plant beans, soybeans, which they require a higher pH soil than wheat or milo, 
if you, if you want to plan on planting beans, you need to lime your ground, get it up to so the recommendations, which is around six, six, five. Uh, you need to also fix your, if you got any low spots that don't drain well, fix them and, and try to, uh, if you have some ditching, you need to get that taken care of and get it smooth. Start out on a good, start out on a good playing field and things will work a lot better. And also hard pan. Uh, if you've been doing a lot of shallow tillage operations with a sweet plow or a, a, or a lot of disking, you can have a hard pan six inches below the surface which can really mess you up. So some type of deep tillage to get through that tillage layer will greatly benefit getting started in no-till. Try to alleviate your problems before you start and have a lot better success. With an annual rainfall of 14 to 18 inches, Bob Dietrich uses reduced tillage to conserve moisture and prevent wind erosion on his Oklahoma Panhandle farm. Well, I got into no-till, reduced till. We planted our first no-till sorghum in standing wheat stubble in 1984. The reason being was to try to control wind erosion more than anything else. Bob grows two crops in a three-year rotation system. I guess the best way to describe our crop rotational sequence would be to start after grain sorghum harvest. In the, we utilize the wheat, sorghum, fallow rotation on our crops to try to see that our soil profile is loaded with water as much as possible. We're in a low rainfall area we spray our grain sorghum stalks with Roundup 2,4-D finesse to control broadleaf weeds and to control grasses. That gets us past, gets us up to harvest. Then we will, our wheat is planted actually as reduced till wheat. We will sweep it two to three times in the summertime with five foot sweep blades to cut off tumble windmill grass, perennial grass that we have a problem with. Then we'll plant, we try to leave all the residue up that we can. We'll plant wheat, put down 20 pounds of N and 20 pounds of FOSS as we plant, dribble it into the, into the wheat seed furrow. Then we'll top dress our wheat and run some weed control on it. Post harvest, we'll run Roundup 2,4-D plus something for some residual control and uh, we'll let that wheat stubble set to the following spring, run around up 2,4-D ahead of planting, plus something for grass control, and uh, plant sorghum into year-old standing wheat stubble. Then we'll go, from, we'll go from sorghum back the following year to lay fallow, soaking up water to get ready to go to wheat. But that's our cropping system, is wheat followed by sorghum followed by fallow period. We get two crops, out of three years. The rotational system is an important part of his field management. I chose to rotate for disease control, weed control, several of these things. Because diseases on wheat, your root rotting complexes and all this thing are lowered. Diseases on sorghum, fusarium and some of these other things are lowered, your incidence of disease. So, plus you have the benefit of more stored soil moisture. We found out as we went along that water conservation is just as valuable as wind erosion control. And they both go hand in hand, they work together. So if you can store an extra inch of water on grain sorghum, depending on, you know, on your annual rainfall, but an extra inch of water can be from seven to 20 bushel, depending on what time of season that, that uh, the rain falls. It takes about, eight inches to get wheat to grow through the vegetative stage or sorghum to go through the vegetative stage. Then each inch beyond that starts paying off rather handsomely. If we can keep residue on the surface, we can store about nine inches of water. Therefore, we can grow our crop through the vegetative stage and get it started into reproduction. That way then the rainfall that we get during the crop growing period goes towards grain production. 
Like many farmers, Bob adapts his equipment to fit his needs. Not being able to plant his 1,100 acres of milo as quickly as he would like to, Bob added eight more rows to his planter. I had an eight row John Deere Max Merge that I had rigged up to plant and fertilize and one pass across the field. And with about 1,100 acres of my own milo, I wasn't getting there in what I considered a timely fashion. So I started looking around. I found a used 12 row planter up in Kansas. So I bought it, sold some of the parts off of it, took eight rows off of the thing and made a 16 row. This is a wing fold, much like John Deere's 12 row Max Emerge. I put a little different type of hinge on the thing so that the hinge would have no give in it. Uh, I moved my gauge wheels to the front of the toolbar so that there wouldn't be any side thrust and twisting in the bar itself. And that's worked quite well on, on seed placement. We're set up to plant no-till grain sorghum in year-old standing wheat stubble. So with year-old stubble, we have to go through and rake stuff aside. I mean, we get windstorms that blow stubble down. Prepare a slight seed bed, fertilize, put down most of our fertilizer in, you know, at the same time as we're planting. Then our double disc opener on this Max Emerge planter makes our final seed bed preparation, or seed slice, and we close it and we go on. That way then we can move our stubble, fertilize, plant in one, you know, in one trip and lose very little moisture. And that's, that's the name of the game in our part of the world's moisture conservation. On our fertilizer here, and it's coming out in this yellow tube, try to be able to place our fertilizer so that the plant will pick it up so we can get up and get running. Then if we go in and cultivate, we try to put on a little bit more nitrogen and hopefully everything works. Sometimes we just have to get by with what we put down at planting time. Machinery cost in no-till, a no-till drill or a no-till planter is more expensive than uh, conventional. Your ma overall machinery lineup is less machinery overall than what you would use in a conventional tillage setup. The downside, I guess, if you want to look at it that way, is the cost of chemical. You're going to pay for it up front. So your cost of chemical, while it is a production expense that you face, you know, right at planting time or whenever, or previous, you know, the previous year for wheat stubble, that is, is, not any worse than the payments on the machinery that you would have to have to farm the same amount of ground, your long-term payments. So it's a trade-off in chemical for machinery payments. So cost-wise, you're going to have the same dollars an acre overall, maybe slightly more in a no-till than you have in conventional till, depending on how many trips you make but your yields overall are normally substantially better than what your conventional farming is, at least in this area. However, conservation tillage does require planning. No-till farming is different because you need to plan your work, your cropping sequence, one, two, three years ahead. The chemicals that you might use, the sequence of crops, everything else, you need to write it down just like you'd write down a marketing plan. I'm going to have wheat this year. I'm going to have sorghum next year. I'm going to have spring oats, field pea for hay the following spring. Something like this. You need to plan ahead, not get up in February and say, gosh, what are we going to grow this summer? you got to have a plan, and you got to stick with the plan. And for those interested in conservation tillage, Bob suggests looking for a local farmer who's already doing it. By and large, if you can work with a neighbor that's doing some no-till or get somebody that's a few miles off to, to do some custom planting for you, you can kind of get into the thing and they will have some of the problems figured out as, you know, planter, how to plant it, some of these things.
conservation tillage can help solve the problem of high winds and sporadic rainfall on the western Oklahoma plains. But Richard Waters has found that conservation tillage also aids with time management. Richard has been a leader in conservation tillage for over 40 years. On his farm near Hydro, he grows no-till grain sorghum, soybeans, wheat, and cotton. I have used conservation tillage since the late 50s, mid to late 50s. Since about uh, the late 70s, I, I began to develop curiosity about no-till. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Jim Stigler showed up one day from OSU and uh, talked to me a little bit about a project. And, and we did some work on uh, dry land grain sorghum no-till on a place I was farming at that time. And uh, Jim arranged to uh, provide me with a, with a buffalo no-till planter. And uh, we used that fellow a couple of years. And I began to get a little enthused about no-till. And uh, the, the curiosity side of me went to work. And so uh, uh, I bought this 800 planter you see here. And this, this planter has been here since uh, about 81 or 2. And uh, it, it has done a real good job and still is doing a good job. And uh, in fact, I, I don't really know that I need to change anything on it at this point. It does everything I want it to. The uh, trash whippers on the front, I have a fertilizer applicator disc there that I use when I'm row banding. And if I broadcast, I can just raise these discs up and uh, go right on and just use the uh, double disc openers on the planter. And uh, I have uh, planted uh, no-till cotton in 30-inch rows. Uh, I'm planting uh, grain sorghum in 30-inch rows. Uh, we uh, do some dry land soybeans, 30-inch rows. and. Uh, we have developed some ideas about population and so on to use. The reason Richard uses conservation tillage is simple. I'd say the predominant reason goes back to, to that very word conservation. You know, you, you, uh, you conserve moisture, you conserve the land, and uh, the, the, uh, the second part of it is, is time management. You, you just don't spend a lot of time out there just driving around in the field in, in your tractor. For Richard, conservation tillage has also improved the quality of his soil. The organic matter test has come up on most of the fields from a half percent to about a one percent or, or close to that, which is a doubling right. <laughs> and uh, it's still way low. More organic matter means improved soil structure and a healthier field overall. A successful conservation tillage system depends on soil and weather characteristics which vary from region to region. To help determine what works best on his farm, Richard set aside a set of production fields to experiment with new techniques. This field uh, immediately behind me here is what I call my going to school field. It's 90 acres in size and is divided into six 15 and a half, half acre strips. And uh, this is a place where we use uh, strips to control wind and water movement. And uh, this, this particular field is set up on uh, a rotation of one year of wheat or small grains, one year of uh, summer plants, uh, grain sorghum, cow peas, or soybeans. Uh, we have some flexibility there. And uh, then one, one year of fallow. So we have two crops in three years, and the uh, uh, on the average, it's worked out to where the net is just real close to continuous cropping, and uh, because we get much higher yields uh, by having the year of fallow in there, and we get an increase in the yield also because of the rotation. Uh, you can look to the backside over here. We have wheat, strip of wheat behind us is. 1999 straw. Over here is another strip of wheat which was double cropped into uh, soybean stubble from the summer crop. And so uh, that changes the rotation just a little bit on that strip but it's part of our flexibility and uh, we try to try to use that flexibility then to work with the moisture that's available 
and the, the growing season that's available. So the things we learned here, we've tried to use on some other places over here. While crop production may increase with no-till, the real benefit for Richard is cost savings. Yields are equal to or better than about any, any in the country, and, and uh, they can be documented. There's a wider spread all the time in favor of no-till because of the cost of fuel and the cost of equipment. And, and you don't wear out near the equipment in no-till as you do doing the other, so your inventory is not as high. Richard has some tips for those who are getting into no-till. Never let the weeds get a head start on you. Start with a clean field, and, and uh, now this field was just sprayed several days prior to this, so it doesn't look clean yet, but it will in two or three more days. And uh, just stay ahead of the stuff right from the get-go, and, and uh, that helps. If you've, got a, if you've got a pan in your soil, take care of it. I'm still working on mine. I didn't take care of it first. Western Oklahoma is known for its wind erosion, lack of moisture, and poor soil structure, conditions which Danny Davis is familiar with. Together with his father, Doc, Danny farms no-till cotton in Washita County, Oklahoma. They began using conservation tillage as a way to control the wind erosion and reduce labor and machinery costs. Eventually, they went to no-till. Danny credits conservation tillage as the main reason they have been able to stay in farming. I don't really like to brag on the yields. Uh, we do have, I would, I would say, probably above average yields for our area here. No-till, row-till, and it doesn't make it rain. It's not going to make, you know, rain. But the thing I see about our yields is that, that we're more consistent with them, uh, especially the last two years, the 98-99 season, extremely dry, you know, and we had tremendous yields for the years. You know, we had cotton that approached two bales last year. You know, that's not a terrible bad cotton yield, really don't matter where you're at. Danny Davis began experimenting with no-till more than 20 years ago. When we got started in this in the late 70s, I came back from college and began farming with my dad. And we had a horrible spring, lots of sandstorms. And one night we were running rotary hose crossways of the cotton rows till about three o'clock in the morning. And uh, I came to work the next morning and I told my dad, I, I just can't handle this anymore. We've got to find a better way or, or something's, you know, we're gonna have to change. And we kind of were heading into the crisis period of the mid eighties there when, you know, Warman took a downturn. And we just weren't able to operate enough land in this country to uh, sustain both of our families. And it was just a cycle of, you know, we take on some more land, that, that meant, you know, more sets of machineries and uh, another hired hand, which, you know, just more expense, more repair costs. And so we started really looking real serious at uh, some type of conservation tillage. And we began with uh, mulch tillage or high residue farming. And we tried strip farming a few years where we'd have uh, like 30 foot strips of wheat. 90 and 120 foot strips of row crop and there were some good and bad in all of those things uh, and we've seen a lot of the benefits to, that we you know hope to see as far as controlling wind and water erosion but it just we had such poor soil characteristics when we started we, our soils run about two to three tenths of one percent organic matter uh, and compaction was just horrible and we uh, had enough faith and seen enough with the, the, our early attempts at no-till to see what the residue on the surface would do for as far as erosion. And we run across this row-till machine, uh, which is the enroll subsoiler or strip tillage machine. And we double cropped uh, in the summer of 1981, mung beans and milo behind wheat, and absolutely fell in love with the, the system. And uh, we converted all of our row crop over in 1982 to the row-till or strip-till system. And uh, we decided, you know, we had a little family meeting and we decided we were gonna go one way or the other and, and we didn't want two sets of machinery. And uh, one way, you know, of seeing something through is make a commitment. 
to it. And that was you know, a big step for us. We weren't farming quite as large an acreage as we are now at that time, but uh, it was uh, probably the best. That's probably the only reason we're still farming when I mean, we started that. And as we went through the years, we run strictly row-till, strip-till, uh, all up until probably 91, 92. And we really got to thinking since we had our traffic patterns established and and, uh, and about the only thing we were doing was running the roteal just to put fertilizer down behind the shanks. And uh, so we started looking at no-till, you know, rather than running the ripper. And that's an awful expensive trip besides the moisture that you work out of the ground. We still had to have, you know, a rain or two to get replenished the moisture. And we started looking at full no-till. And uh, we just, this year we're probably Somewhere is 90% or better full no-till out of all of our cotton acres. Uh, and I, we haven't looked back since. Danny has discovered that long-term no-till farming has benefits other than erosion and moisture retention. The return of earthworms to his fields is a sign that his percentage of organic matter has increased. This spring, that a farm in 1982 that was three-tenths of one percent, and it came back two uh, percent, with an 8 inch sample that we took, which I was pretty proud of that. That's the first one I had over 2%. While no-till farming reduces the overall effort and time required, field management becomes crucial. We don't ever quit farming. I mean, there's never a time that, that there's not either something out there or something growing. And we uh, intercede our rye prior to the cotton harvest. We'll start normally about the middle part of August, sowing rye in between the cotton rows with the shielded drill and try to have that cover crop up and established uh, after harvest where it's already big enough to keep the land from blowing. And in some cases where we'll have you know, good cattle grazing uh, off the rye. Uh, and then we allow that rye to grow in the early spring, normally in our no-till farms uh, around the first part of April, we'll start looking at shooting the Roundup. Uh, just depends on the winter and the moisture and the growth. But we look more at the condition or the size of the rye than we do the calendar. Danny has found that by being flexible in running his stock cutter, he can increase his moisture content from winter snows. We like to wait till after there's real poss you know, any real possibility of a blowing snow, because you know, what snows we get normally come with wind, and the cotton stalks will help trap that. But we like to have those done uh, all March, February and March. That's kind of our late winter job is you know, running a stalk cutter. And I really don't like to get on, that, on the fields any more than I have to after we kill the rye, because every pass, don't really matter what you're doing, it's going to take it to the ground. And the, and the, and the more erect and, and that you can keep the straw, you know, the more wind protection you'll get for the cotton. And Since the ground is never tilled out, chemicals are necessary to control weeds. We've been kind of experimenting. We, we use a, uh, like in February or March, normally we'll put out a, a 2,4-D or a phenoxy type herbicide to take care of our winter broadleaves. And on quite a bit of our no-till acreage this year, we broadcasted three pints of prowl at that time. And uh, well, it's not something that we do on all of our acres yet. We're not that comfortable with it, but we've had pretty good success with it. And, it, you know, it's, it's fast and easy. On the rest of our ground, we'll put it out just in the band over the top of the row with the little, our bed worker machine. Right. And just you know, like in a 20, 22 inch band. Uh, we like to be done with that by 1st of May. And with any little 3 tenth shower we get, we can plant on. And, uh, th that's, that's sort of our, we still, even though we're, we've grown all Roundup Ready cotton for the last, uh, I guess this will be our fourth or fifth season, I still think that yellow program's uh, pretty good insurances. No-till is not a practice anyone should just rush into. According to Danny, it requires planning and commitment. If you're not confident in your abilities to think a plan through, you know, find somebody you can watch or talk to. Uh, I've found over the 20 years we've been doing this that, that uh, no-till people are 
more or less an outcast in the community anyway, and they, they enjoy a good friend, you know, if they're two miles or 20 or 200 miles away. But, you know, study it a little bit before you don't just go out here and say, well, I'm not going to plow, I'm going to plant, and uh, you're going to have some problems. And the other thing, the biggest single failure or cause of failure that I see is people will try it on just a little bitty, you know, 10, 20, 30 acre patch. And, uh, you know, first something that comes along is, well, you know, I'll give it up, it's not going to work anyway. My, my advice would be to try it on a large enough piece of acreage that it hurts if it don't work. And I know that's a lot, may fly in the face of a lot of people's advice, but, uh, you know, you get enough of it where it bites you, you're going to make it work. And, and